If you've watched something on Disney Plus in the last year, there's a chance that you've seen this disclaimer. This program includes negative depictions and or mistreatment of people or cultures. These stereotypes were wrong then and are wrong now. Rather than remove this content, we want to acknowledge its harmful impact, learn from it, and spark conversation to create a more inclusive future together. It then gives a website where you can go to learn more about the stereotypes. I don't really have a problem with that. I mean, it's basically what I've argued for in the past. I grew up watching so many Disney films that have harmful stereotypes in them, and this isn't the only way, but it's one way of explicitly identifying and educating audiences about them. But then you open up the website and see that there are only four examples. They pretty explicitly say what's wrong with each film, but there are only four. This is where the whole thing falls apart. There are movies that they clearly don't want in the service, but then there are others that are so popular that people expect them to be there. So putting a disclaimer is Disney's way of dealing with that. But with the incredibly vague website, the disclaimer just feels performative. Is reading about racist stereotypes in the Aristocats supposed to help me identify and understand racist stereotypes in Aladdin? Both movies have the same exact disclaimer, but if I were to only watch Aladdin and go to the website suggested, I would probably close it because there's no information about the movie. So there's the vague aura of this is problematic without actually having to identify what's wrong. I'd hardly call that progress. And for movies like The Reluctant Dragon that have multiple types of harmful depictions, it's even more unclear. The blanket disclaimer with little context doesn't clarify the racist stereotypes or the homophobic ones. I think it's good that Disney has an advisory board of organizations helping them review their films, but it's been over a year since the site launched and I'm still as confused as ever. On this channel I've talked a lot about Disney's long history with the queer community, but if you want to get the whole picture, we have to leave Disney+. Plus Because on there, Disney's first gay stereotype is nowhere to be found. <laughs> I shot cock Robin, but Robin isn't dead. He fell for little Jenny Wren and landed on his head. In 1929, Disney began one of the most iconic series of short films, The Silly Symphonies. Each of the 75 installments had unique stories and music, using Technicolor and multiplane motion picture cameras to create stunning sequences. The premise, created by composer Carl Stalling, was simple. Each film had a soundtrack that guided the story, and aside from three of them, each installment had unique characters that weren't used elsewhere. Many of the most memorable moments of early Disney animation happened in these shorts. The skeleton dance is one of the most well-known early pieces of Disney animation, the Three Little Pigs had a theme song that became a smash hit, and Donald Duck even appeared for the first time in The Wise Little Hen. But even with the hits, we can start to see their complicated legacies. Like I said, The Three Little Pigs was a huge success, and it won an Academy Award for Best Short Film. And during World War II, the animation and style was used to create a Canadian anti-Nazi propaganda film that depicted the wolf as a Nazi. But at the same time that the film was being used in this way, the original still had a sequence in which the wolf dressed up as an anti-Semitic caricature of a Jewish peddler. This would later be edited out in 1947. The edited version of The Three Little Pigs is on Disney+. Plus. Though for the first 11 months it was on the service, it had a curious label saying that it was presented as originally created, which wasn't true. Disney Plus also has edited versions of other things that also featured stereotypes, such as the Silly Symphony Santa's Workshop. However, there are 75 Silly Symphonies in total, and only a fraction of them made it onto the streaming service. One of the shorts you won't find on Disney Plus is The Cookie Carnival, a silly symphony where cartoon versions of baked goods compete for the affection of a girl who wants to be the queen at the carnival. Like a lot of shorts from this time, it's early Disney at its finest. The animation is beautiful, the music and sound design work so well, and the overall style was ambitious and cutting edge for its time. But watch this. We're the angel food cake, we want it understood. They're gay, right? Well, no, but it's complicated, right? I'd say they're queer-coded. And when this came out in 1935, it was generally prohibited to display queerness on film because of the Hays Code. So stereotypes about queer people were used to convey that the characters were gay without saying anything. And that's queer coding, using mannerisms, gestures, and voices that communicate stereotypes. In this situation, the femininity of the characters seems to be the joke. Is this Disney's first gay stereotype? I don't know. And that's what feels so confusing when talking about queer coding. 
As a queer person, I feel like I'm highly sensitive to seeing stereotypes. I mean, while growing up, I took to heart how others saw me. After a while, I understood which things I did that people would interpret as queer. So I started to change my behavior, to be acutely aware of every gesture, inflection, and even opinion that would be interpreted by others. Not because those things made me gay or queer or trans, but because those types of supposedly gendered behavior directly affected how easy my life was, how I was treated by others, and specifically if I was bullied by others. But I wasn't only a victim. After a while of having to behave like that, I noticed that the way I was looking at myself and the way I interacted with others was also perpetuating these queerphobic archetypes. When I was in middle school, I was a classic case of someone who made homophobic jokes in a desperate plea to deflect the homophobic jokes away from me, only to realize that I am queer in 8th grade. And even though I started to love my queerness in high school, it still took many years of battling internalized homophobia for me to completely love it. And now when I watch the cookie carnival, I see the angel food cakes as queer coded. Because I know what jokes people make about queer people. And I also know how queer people were treated back then. But just like any video I make about queer coding, I'm not sure that everyone will see it that way. Did the characters say they're gay? Why do you have to impose your life choices onto everything? Aren't you the one spreading stereotypes? But that's the insidious thing about queer coding, right? Queer people have stereotypes imposed upon them by default causing genuine traits that are a part of their experience to be the butt of the joke. But by talking about it, they're also chastised for perpetuating those stereotypes. It's there, but it also isn't. I've talked before in this channel about how queer coding isn't an inherently bad thing. It's also provided LGBTQ people with the tools to subtly insert queer aesthetics into situations where they wouldn't be understood by non-queer audiences. But in this situation, I can only think about how it represents queerphobia and Hollywood trends at the time. But whether or not that's Disney's first gay stereotype depends on how you define the first gay stereotype. There's no quotes that I know of regarding any queer coding in that short, so it's hard to say what the exact intent was. And I can speculate about queerphobia and historical context, but that's not as interesting to me as having a direct quote or document saying what the writers meant to do. Which brings us to Who Killed Cock Robin, another silly symphony that didn't make it to Disney+. Plus. And there's a queer coded character in this short who we know was meant to be that way. The short is based off of the old nursery rhyme of the same name, and in Disney's version, we find out that a bird called Dan Cupid shot Cock Robin, but didn't kill him. <laughs> I shot Cock Robin, but Robin isn't dead. He fell for little Jenny Wren and landed on his head. <laughs> See where I'm going with this? But like I said, this time it's different. In 1934, writer Bill Cottrell dictated a summary of the film to a stenographer, which includes a description of Dan Cupid. Cupid has a hysterical laugh like Ed Wynn, and talks in a lisping Nance voice. All his actions typify the hand-on-hip, I'll-slap-your-wrist attitude of a Nance. But what does Nance mean? It's a word most associated with the early 1900s, but its origin actually goes back to the 1800s. Since then, Miss Nancy was used as a way of making fun of effeminate men. It supposedly originated in the UK from a nickname for the actress Anne Oldfield, and through prison slang it was shortened to Nancy, and then eventually shortened to just Nance. But on a mainstream level, the difference between effeminate men and gay men in the US was… well, there wasn't much of a difference. So in the 1930s, Nance was used in jokes, usually at the expense of queer people. One of Al Jolson's favorite offstage jokes involved a fictional exchange between two effeminate Schubert chorus boys. Do you know Nance O'Neill? No, who is he? But words are complicated, and Nance had other meanings too. The Nance, or Nancy Boy, was a gay burlesque character from the 1930s who brought guffaws and belly laughs as he pranced about the stage, creating campy scenes and sketches of gay life. He put on an outrageous show, and audiences loved him. In the late 1930s, New York Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia, fearful of how the lurid burlesque shows would make his city look in the upcoming World's Fair of 1939, cracked down on the houses. Part of LaGuardia's anger was aimed at the Nance, whom critics said created audiences of lusty gay men having sex in the dark balconies of the burlesque emporiums. It was an outrage, the mayor said, and police began swooping down on burlesque shows, closing many and forcing others to drop the Nance Act or greatly curb it. So when Bill Cottrell says that Dan Cupid has a lisping Nance voice and the hand on hip I'll slap your wrist attitude of a Nance, he's talking about a stereotype of gay men at the time. Nance is definitely an antiquated word, but certain versions of it are still around. When I was growing up in the late 90s, early 2000s US, I never heard Nance, but I definitely heard older family members say Nancy Boy, which was a synonym for it back in the day. Was Bill Cottrell queerphobic? 
I don't know, and I wouldn't necessarily say he was based off of that one quote. It's complicated. I think it's important to look back and recontextualize words to show how they've upheld oppression, and there are plenty of words like that in queer history, including Nance. But we also know that Nance had multiple meanings, and I also want to be careful that I don't assume his intent, because I think that leaves out an important narrative. The people who internalized and used oppressive language in a passive way, not understanding the impact of their words. And that's a disturbing thing about pop culture. When it's being dictated by a group of people who are oppressing others, almost every element of that oppression becomes baked in, leading to some people passively perpetuating stereotypes without understanding their harm. That doesn't make it right, but I think fully understanding queer oppression in society requires looking at those nuances, because they help us understand systemic prejudice as opposed to ascribing blame solely within a nebulous binary of good or bad people. A funny vaudeville show for one person could be a life-threatening display of stereotypes to another, and in an industry where there were often queer people playing the stereotypical roles, the person playing the role might also have a different perspective. I don't want to get caught up in that nuance, so I'll just focus on what Bill Cottrell said and what he said was a harmful stereotype of queer people at the time, and that makes Dan Cupid an offensive gay stereotype. And while we're at it, Who Killed Cock Robin is filled with satire and stereotypes. Today, Cock Robin lives on as a bit of nursery nonsense. When we made it into a silly symphony in 1934, it was voted one of the best 10 pictures of the year. In it, we satirize prominent personalities of the day. Perhaps you'll recognize some of them. Cock Robin is clearly a crooner based off of Bing Crosby and has what I think is one of the most beautiful melodies in early Disney, written by Frank Churchill. And Jenny Wren is definitely Mae West. But aside from Dan Cupid, there are also other harmful stereotypes in the short, such as the jury that resembles a minstrel choir and the blackbird who appears to be a step and fetch type character. Who Killed Cock Robin would be nominated for Best Animated Short Film at the Academy Awards, but it would lose to another silly symphony, Three Orphan Kittens. The short's success, along with plenty of other animations from the 30s that featured harmful stereotypes, reveals the prejudices and oppressive structures that were permissible in pop culture at the time. Walt Disney won the Best Animated Short Film category every year in the 30s, with 9 out of 10 of the winning films being silly symphonies. But despite that, two of the winning shorts among a wide range of silly symphonies aren't available on Disney Plus at the time of recording this video. So that's the story of Disney's first gay stereotype. And you could also say that Dan Cupid is technically the first queer-coded Disney villain. But there's always more to learn. Just like the angel food cakes in the Cookie Carnival, maybe there are more queer-coded characters from earlier cartoons. But for me, it's important not to just imprint my understanding of queer coding onto these characters, but look for direct information about the intent of the artists. And before you comment this, no, I'm not saying that a joke character is good representation. But I also think it's really important to talk about these things, and the nuances regarding queer history. Even though we weren't alive back then, it's our history too. And if we want to know where we're going, we have to know where we're coming from. Do do do.